thank you everyone for for joining us tonight um please feel free to um show yourselves i mean well you know with your faces Careful. <laughs> um because um tonight's going to be very it, it's going to be a bit interactive and um we're very much wanting you to enjoy um this evening which is that the third in our lunar society online black in series we are so thrilled um that we've been able to use this forum to just forward focus our mission which is to stimulate ideas to broaden debate and to catalyze action and we're doing this celebrating and honoring Black History Month in the UK. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Deirdre Labassier, and I am so excited and happy to welcome you in my capacity as the current chair of the Lunar Society. So I thought we'd just kind of go through a few house rules before we start. Um, some of you missed me in my my robe it was my my house robe but that won't be happening <laughs> any longer with the rest of this evening so i'll spare you that um but for the rest of this evening um the event is being recorded so if you want to be anonymous what i said at the beginning about showing yourselves if you do want to be anonymous please just turn your camera off you are welcome to use the mute button during the meeting other than when you are speaking and of course that button's found at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you want to make a point, or if you wanna ask a question, you can signal to the chair um, of the event, who is Martin Levermore, or to myself that you want to speak by using the reactions button. So you can either send a thumbs up or you can raise your hand as well if you'd like. Um, and you're also, of course, welcome to show your agreement with what a speaker is saying throughout by using the hand clapping facility. And of course, please do use the chat feature. So that will allow you to ask questions, to comment um, on anything that somebody else is saying whilst they are speaking. So tonight, very excited. We're here to talk about Black in innovation and technology. Some might say that innovation and technology are the pistons that drive the energy of civilization in any era. The Lunar Society of Birmingham and its members was 250 years ago and still are, I would say, quite comfortably responsible for numerous scientific and technological advancements and quite some innovation. In fact, 250 years ago, different personalities actually found acceptance within the Lunar Society. The achievements of its individual members, much like now through our members, such as our esteemed chair for the evening, Martin Levermore, MBE, and Michael Don Smith, together with our esteemed panelists, Drew Curry and Marika Beckford, can be credited in part to their intellectual abilities, of course, but of also to the new pattern of scientific, innovative and technical cooperation that was so prevalent amongst the lunar men, which led to their success. The Lunar Society of Birmingham was quite unique and frankly disruptive for its period. Lunar interests were kaleidoscopic. They range from optics and astronomy, chemistry and mechanics, mechanics <laughs> hydraulics and, and minerals. The practical, the theoretical and the creative merged. And in fact, all of them were interested in minerals. Matthew Bolton was interested in metallurgy, Josiah Wedgwood, ceramics, and then you had Watt, Darwin, Keir, Priestley in chemical examinations. Now, just last year, the Lunar Society celebrated James Watt, an inventor, a mechanical engineer, and a chemist. Together with the rest of the world, we marked the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of his death and the 250th anniversary of his patent for a separate condenser. In other words, his steam engine. And that was actually fundamental to the development of the industrial revolution and changed the projection of the world. Now, I was reading this book, don't know if you can see it. It's called Capitalism and Slavery. 
And it was written by this man, Sir Eric Williams in 1944. And he was the first prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago and a noted Caribbean historian. So that's capitalism and slavery. So he argued that the West India merchant capital founded on plantation slavery underpinned the financing of the Bolton and Watt steam engine. But it could also be argued that those same steam engines shipped to Caribbean slave owners from 1803 up to the final stages of plantation slavery in 1838, because of their technology, allowed a greater extraction of the valuable juice from the sugar canes at a quicker pace, therefore negating the need for the high level of cattle and enslaved labor that was necessary to keep the system running, thereby actually contributing to the end of the economic viability of slavery. We also had amongst the original lunar men, people like Thomas Day, who wrote an early anti-slavery poem, The Dying Negro in 1773. Josiah Wedgwood, who produced a medallion showing a chain slave with the motto, am I not a man and a brother? to raise awareness of the horrors of slavery and bring to an end the slave trade. And of course, there was Joseph Sturge, who was instrumental in bringing the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass to Birmingham and who founded the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society who has survived today to be Anti-Slavery International. I am truly delighted that tonight we have the honor of hearing from a panel and an esteemed chair who much like the original Lunar Men passionately believe that their work, their contributions to innovations and technologies, their part in discoveries and enabling the same makes the world a better place. So the arts is a golden thread that has been running through this series. And tonight we are honored and delighted to feature later this evening the incomparable Dominican born and Italian trained opera singer who fuses jazz into her repertoire, who has sung at Carnegie Hall and the UN, Marie Claire Giraud. But first, we have a poet who is a Windrush child, whose grandmother put him on a plane to the motherland in 1969. He has gone on to great things, an international businessman who has run his own IT company for over 10 years, who's traveled internationally to places as diverse as Taiwan and Barbados, and has guest lectured top businessmen and women at Birmingham University. He gives advice to African farming forums and takes his inspiration for his poetry from everyday life events and admiration for educators such as Jane Elliott. So it is with pleasure that I introduce to you our poet resident for the evening, who tends to look directly for the obvious in plain sight, Mr. Alan Bennett. Good evening all, good evening to you all. Bit nervous, but um, I'm glad to hear what you just said, Deidre, um, in terms of the historic things that you've just given, which is, um, you know, part of the base of my uh, poem. Um, and the thing is that we, the poem goes, but still, and uh, basically things that say, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know. That's what people say today of our inventions and things that they didn't know because we kept out of education. But the poem goes like this, it goes, but still, ah, let's get to it. The story of our hidden forbidden history, our innovations, inventions considered unsolved mysteries. From the pyramids to the simple crisp, such complexity, such simplicity, but still. Can it not be accepted we are the architects of such lasting legacy? Where's our glory? Where's our praise? In this sordid world we live in, innovations and technology keeps it spinning. Throughout slavery, we were property to be vilified and dis with disparaging words filled with hatred, mistreated at the slightest whim. With daily rigor, you applied your deadly sin, but still. We sought to please you, to elevate you above ourselves. So we lit a fuse and set a trail to invent and innovate, to make light of our work and ease our pain, but still. We continue to swallow the bitter pill. Our innovations and inventions were as we were, 
your property. But still, the thought of open black recognition, innovation and invention makes some of you ill. But still, to name a few, to open your mind with knowledge instilled, the names of black innovators and inventors like Sarah Boone, Mary Van Bitten Brown, Garrett Morgan, Thomas Mensah, Lonnie Smith, Lonnie Johnson, the list goes on. I hear you whisper, I didn't know, I didn't know, but still. But how could you know when we are all miseducated by a system that wishes us all not to know? The children of the world have united in our pain. They will change your black narrative so the world can gain. But still, I ask of you, can we therefore conclude those black lives matter? Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Alan. I think I'm, I'm actually going to invite people to unmute and give Alan the benefit of hearing <laughs> your round of applause. I think that was absolutely hey. wonderful. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that that you know it's it's actually is uh, quite incredible that um, you speak. You spoke there about changing the narrative to, to change the world. And that really sets the scene for what we're going to be discussing tonight. And Martin had, um, is, is starting off with posing the question, what was that light bulb moment and what was the unmet need? And I, I kind of, when I think of Martin, I think that he is a light bulb moment and he certainly works very hard in his various capacities as a visiting professor uh, at Birmingham City University, as a, a founder and business development director for his company, Medical Devices Technology Limited. Um, and having worked in such varied and, and intense roles, um, including consultancy roles um, and global roles, where he, he literally walks the talk in meeting that unmet need. So it was with great honor and um, that I am I'm privileged to welcome with great humbleness, the amazing Professor Martin Levermore. Thank you, Deirdre. <laughs> Absolutely a roaring introduction, and I don't think I could ever do that justice. Um, may I say welcome to all. Um, join us here this evening. Um, and I will also like to welcome my panel, um, Marika Bickford, Luke Curry, and Michael Don Smith. And we'll talk more about and give each of them an opportunity to speak. But, Again, I wanted to, to thank Alan for such a inspiring poem. Um, anyone who's been down the road of new technology, innovation, that, that the barriers that can be created to the adoption and the diffusion is always, always a uh, frustrating pathway. Um, Peter Drucker, the Austrian-born American management consultant, educator and author, um, kindly said when he was around in his good old days that innovation is the specific instrument of entrepreneurship. The act that endeavors resources with a new capacity to create wealth. It says the, a a new capacity to create wealth, not the exploitation of wealth. And I think the opening that Deirdre explained um, means that for centuries, for years, uh, the intellectual rigor of wherever that came from to be put into the melting pot to change and improve lives had not always been given the right opportunity or, or even been given the right respect. So I'm actually overwhelmed to have Marika with us, who in this world we are all sharing, the digital world, that we've got a digital officer, somebody who understands 
and especially from a female perspective, the value in which technology is allowing us to connect in a different way in order to improve our interactions, our understanding and communication. Juru, my fellow founder and innovators, um, somebody's always looking at the opportunity. Um, what can I say? Um, we've gone along a, a, a very interesting pathway for years, but what's most important was always looking at how you are going to improve the next man's life, not your own. And I think that will go on that down the road. And Michael, um, all I'm going to say is that anyone who serves uh, Her Majesty's services is obviously someone who's got a large degree of integrity. As a fellow person in arms myself, Michael, years ago, we understand that thing about supporting, servicing, and understanding what it means to put others before ourselves. And that, that, that takes us down this, the road where it begs a number of questions when we look at innovation and technology. It begs the questions where people of color sit in the landscape. And I'd like just to ask my fellow panelists a few questions as we go along and hope that as we share this time, that everyone will get a better understanding that actually the black in innovation and technology has not just been there for a few years. It has been there for decades and centuries. And the black in innovation and technology is happening today to which we all embrace and benefit from, but so often we forget about it. So I'm going to throw my first question open to Drew, if I may, and I will ask the same of my panelists. What kind of contributions to science and technology do you believe black inventors have made over the years? Drew. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Deirdre. And thank you, uh, lunatics for inviting me <laughs> to talk to you today. I am truly, truly honoured. And um, uh, it's interesting, Deirdre's introduction took me from uh, a level of conversation that I thought we were going to have to a level of conversation that I think we are going to have. Because um, there's been occasions where um, for me, I've wanted to talk about certain things, but we, I, have to, I get used to pitching it at a certain level and not being completely honest and, and open. And uh, Deirdre and, and Martin, your introduction has, has given me the, um, the, the, the skill and the, um, and the understanding and the permission to be able to be, uh, to be more open and honest with, with all of you. Um, so going back to Martin's question, what kind of contributions to, to, to science? Um, I wasn't going to go uh, uh, real deep, but I'm going to go uh, to, to my kind of level. So I'd like to also say hello to my melanin challenged brothers and sisters. OK, we are all brothers and sisters here. So I'll teach you a few things. I've taught David something earlier. So we talk about uh, BPT. Black people time. So if you have a conversation with somebody, uh, you can say, and they're a person of colour, of black origin, say, um, if they turn up, a little, uh, turn up a little bit late, say to them, are oh, you like GPT or GMT? And then they will understand that you, you know people of colour. So straight away, you'll have more of an affinity to them. So you can learn that that's BPT. So, um, and I'm truly grateful for you to learn um, and want to learn about some of my experiences. Um, so the contributions that I, I wanted to talk, talk about, and it's almost where the contributions have always been there, but they've been um, hidden away, where the truth of black innovation has actually been uh, hidden under propaganda, but I think we'll get to that a little bit later. So, but what I wanted to talk about was some of the contributions that I personally thought were very poignant to me. And the first about innovation was the uh, world's um, oldest drawing, 
I was on a rock found in South Africa 73,000 years ago. So the first bit of innovation, the first sim uh, symbolism was, um, was from Africa. That's the first uh, bit of innovation. The other things that I like to uh, draw reference to is uh, innovation where it is not disputed that this was an innov innovation that was developed by a person of color, by a black person. There's some innovations which could be debatable. For example, um, Edison, um, who invented the, or who invented the first touchtone phone, uh, although it's Bell Laboratories, who in Bell Laboratories actually made that innovation can be debated and, uh, and argued. So I would rather look at the ones that are not under de debate or not under discussion. So um, I think about that world's earliest drawing. I think about um, Dr. Charles Drew, who created blood banks and blood plasma programs that have changed people's lives all around the world. And this, this kind of invention that's touched so many lives and saved lives that I didn't learn about at, at school. Um, the other thing where um, Elijah McCoy, who um, Deirdre talked about the um, engines and uh, machinations, and Eli Elijah McCoy, who patented the first automatic machine lubricating system. So these systems of invention were by necessity to make life easier. And some black innovations were actually to extend their life. If you look at some of the innovations that were created for the plantations. So these were to extend life, to stop the back breaking cotton picking work. Um, the other one uh, innovation that I like is just a little bit of fun. And that's the guy, Dr. Lonnie Johnson, who he made 100 patents. He worked on the, um, on the stealth bomber. He worked on NASA, uh, on the Galileo spacecraft. But what my best invention he came up with was the super soaker. So when we were all kids, we were just squirting each other and things like that. He invented that. So I just love that. The, the idea which takes me back to childhood, just blasting people and things like that. So for me, those are the great innovations that um, black people have made uh, uh, through the years. Thank you, Drew. Marika, you're, you're, you're probably the, one of the youngest ones among us. So, <laughs> I, so I'm good. Like, can I pose the same question to you, Marika? What kind of contributions to science and technology do you feel black innovators have made over the years? Um, I, I definitely um, think about the, the film um, around uh, the, I'm just trying to remember the, the name of the film, um, my mind's gone blank, but it was around, um, I'll probably have to Google that one. <laughs> Ladies who went to space? In the covers, maybe. It, it was about the, the, um, the NASA. Um, Hidden Numbers. Hidden yeah, numbers. numbers, that's the one. Hidden <laughs> colours. <laughs> and and um, it it reminds me of of their contribution to um, uh, the st like uh, the STEM sector um, and what they did there. But I think when I think about innovation, I think where I sit in innovation at the moment and currently is very much looking forward to um, the current situation and the future. So we um, in my role at um, at uh, West Midlands Combined Authority and leading on the Digital Skills Partnership. When we talk about innovation, it's very much about how we're shaping um, industry and uh, the curriculum to um, shape the curriculum for the demands of the jobs market or enterprise market. We want to encourage um, people across the region to think about new ideas, new concepts, and new ways of exploring um, how, how technology can ad advance goods or services um, and, diff and various different operations. And one of the key roles that I have in um, in um, ensuring and sort of championing, championing that is around the partnerships that I help um, create. So for example, we are effective, um, we're, we're being affected by the COVID-19 um, pandemic and uh, economically this is um, disrupting how businesses are running and working. Um, and so, uh, other companies, for example, Amazon, um, BT, Microsoft, these larger corporations are acknowledging this and 
um, I've set up a business bootcamp accelerator um, with Amazon um, in partnership with a, a business network called Enterprise Nation. Um, and this is going to be a two day boot camp that's going to be run in November. And this is about innovating businesses who haven't yet adopted the digital transformation that they need for their businesses to thrive online. So we're, to, we're taking it from, you know, high street bricks and we're calling it bricks to clicks. It's about um, how can you get your, your organization to innovate in a space that is online and operate and, and thrive in that, in that online space. So um, this partnership, so as I lead on these partnerships with Amazon and Google and Microsoft, we're, we're looking at those ways where we're helping to really get to the um, needs of uh, the challenges that businesses and, and individuals are finding um, and, and looking to innovate in that space to help them thrive online. So that um, accelerator that I've set up is happening on November the 17th and 18th. It's gonna be a two day intense uh, boot camp um, for uh, businesses that are um, looking to try uh, do their digital transformation. And um, for me, that is a way that I see um, my contribution um, to uh, innovating a space in the, in the here and the now. Thank you, Marika. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to pass it over to Michael, but I, I just wanted to open this up to the floor slightly. Um, for those who don't know, I got caught up into the innovation cycle because there was a gentleman uh, within the West Midlands who talked about our misspent opportunity with intellectual property. And as I was going through the cycle of understanding what that meant, I came across and I'm not sure if you knew of this lady called Mary Kinner. Has anybody heard of Mary Kinner? Uh, I thought Peter made her. <laughs> uh, Peter, would you like just to help us and tell the rest of us here who Mary Kinner was and why this lady was important? No. Right, he's embarrassed, but I'm not. Uh, and you know why I'm not? Because... While you start looking at society and a large proportion of our society who are in desperate need, it appears that innovation comes from those who are in most of need. The sanitary belt, which we would like to call as the menstrual pad, was invented by this lady, an African-American who looked at the need for having an hygienic way for all women. However, nobody knows of this, which is actually repugnant if we consider the value of human hygiene, the value of ensuring that we can all feel better in ourselves. So, Michael, your view. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you very much, Deirdre. Thank you to everyone for attending. And as, again, I'm honored and surprised to be here. I don't mind speaking, but um, I'm still very impressed by the initiative that the Lunar Society has taken to produce this uh, excellent Black History Month series. So, you know, congratulations again, but I don't know if we can say it too often to Deirdre and the rest of the committee at the Lunar Society. For Martin, we, we, it's almost like we um, spoke about this beforehand because I want to follow up with the three things that you've mentioned already, intellectual property, technological change, and um, Marika on technology and change are kind of doing a dance because as Martin said, difficult times or trials and tribulations cause people to innovate. Those innovations create change. Those changes require other opportunities or other problems that create more change. So I could go back to the 1800s to a lady called Sarah Breedlove. 
who people may know more as Madam CJ Walker, who was the first woman millionaire of any color in the Western world. And she did that through her Walker system, which is an innovative technology for dealing with black hair, because she not only had the difficulties of black hair, but also she had a scalp disease. So she spent a lot of time experimenting with chemicals, with chemistry. So she's a very intelligent woman. I could go through stories about how she came to escaping from farm, my first child at 14, but she had a lot of difficulty. But through all that, she became one of the, the largest donators to charity and their story can be um, reviewed. So that was the first thing I want to talk about, blacks in tech. That was technology. But as Martin said, she didn't have the advantage of IP, and I'll come back to that again later. Second thing I'd like to talk about is my time in the Air Force. I was at RF Valley when the Red Arrows moved from the NAP type of aircraft to Hawks. And what I was amazed by because you talked about the thing that um the turning point the trigger the thing that happened you like was that the radio because i was an avionics and aerospace technician the radio in the nat was a huge thing in a small aircraft huge you know, um yay big one with the details good but the hawk was a much bigger aircraft and the radio was about a third of the size why was it a third of the size because it had integrated circuits and one of the leaders in integrated circuits, and the guy was responsible for color PC, the integrated system architecture bus, the five gigahertz chip was Mark Dean. Now, Mark Dean is an IBM hero, and those who know about technology, he's a great inventor. But his current net worth is about one million pounds. I want you to think about that. This guy invented stuff that went into military aircraft. That's where the first iteration of technology always appears in the military. And it's in every PC, that architecture, and he's a leading light. And his net worth is one million pounds. His con people who came after him in the space are billionaires. So think about that and think about IP again. Move forward to 1989, when I was at Mercury Communications, and I was in a room, this is a personal, so I was in a room where as a, I was an engineer and I was in a room with marketers and the marketing guy said, we're gonna release this phone called the Mercury one-to-one. -one, and we're gonna make this phone have three minutes. Does anyone remember the Mercury one-to-one? -one? Any old people here remember Mercury? And it was unheard of. I mean, phone bills then were like 500, 1,000 pounds, your phone bill, never mind the cost of the phone. And Mercury said, we're gonna release this phone and it's gonna have three minutes. People used to use it for baby monitors. It's incredible. And I, I said, you can't do this because you're gonna break the whole system. And this gentleman said, Don, listen to what I'm saying and take action on it. And I didn't know what the hell he was saying. I went, went to Brixton Market where I was talking to a friend of mine who's a market trader and I told him about this. And this guy was not interested in telecoms or phones, but he was very interested in what I said. He said, tell me more. And he took me out and he bought me dinner. There's a young African Caribbean gentleman who is now a multimillionaire. I'm not, I'll let you know. But he got a Mercury one to one contract and started wholesaling mobile phones. That's in the 80s when I was thinking, oh, I was stupid. So, again, bear them out. Technology and the opportunity for transformation is immense. And moving really quickly to in 2015, when a lady called Gwen Jimmery became the first black woman to get a patent for a hair product. And the reason she did that is she knew and she understood generational wealth. You see, if you've got the IP and the patent, you then own the products and the innovations that come off of that patent and you can leverage it. So my thoughts around black in tech is what we need to learn is being clever, being smart. A little tip is, yeah, I want to go to it, is one thing, but being able to um, leverage and capitalize and benefit from that technology, not even in one generation. I mean, there's, there's 
a guy from Drake and Dyden. If you're about Drake and Dyden, another hair company, when they they were the first in the UK to create a million dollar black business, and again it was hair products. But when it came time for them to retire, their children didn't want to take up the the uh, mantle, and so a lot of Asian businesses and American businesses took that and ran with it. So Drake and Dryden actually doesn't exist anymore, but they were the first. So my thought is that we're very good at tech. Um, we're able to do it, but we've got to learn that we need to work with everybody. It's not, it's not color, it's technology. And we need to make sure that technology is available for everybody and we have the IP for it. So that was, I hope that was helpful, Martin. No, that was very helpful. <laughs> It is definitely like we've been sitting in the same room together because it, <laughs> this is going to prompt my next question. But you, the whole idea about intellectual property, um, uh, you know, uh, always stimulates me in terms of that ownership and that legacy ownership and going down the earth. Um, I know back in 1981, uh, Dr. Patricia Bath. Um, invented for the ophthalmology sector uh, a new probe. And today, uh, that probe is being used in speeding up surgical operation around uh, cataracts yeah, for, for millions and millions. However, when she died a couple of years ago at 76, nobody remembered her. A fascinating woman transformed ophthalmology but nobody remembered it, and there was no none of that family legacy in the IP. So, Marika, can I ask you, why do you think some of these in, innovations that have now become integral to our society, the way in which we operate, why is the accomplishment of those who have actually created those intellectual property, created those ideas, are not better known? That's a good question. Um, and you'd think there would be because of uh, how the world is becoming much more connected. Um, why are they not better known? I think the question is about how do we make them become better known? Um, or how do we how do we shine the light on on onto them? And I think it's about um, creating safe spaces to have open conversations like this, to um, give, give platform and recognition. Um, but yeah, I think it's quite quite difficult to to identify why they're not being better known. Um, I, I do think that that, that because, because of that lack of acknowledgement that they should be um, platforms that should create spaces for that to happen. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I see Alan's got it. <laughs> Alan, your, 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 your view. Yeah, well, as you see, I've put in my uh, poem um, the fact that um, they said, well, I didn't know, I didn't know, um, reflects um, on the whole situation where you did the question just raised. Um, and there's, there's uh, a sort of system in place to make sure it doesn't get known. And I mentioned in my poem as well, a guy by the name of Thomas, Thomas Menser. Does anyone know what he's done? And we're actually using the technology that he's responsible for. So the fact that we can hear each other clearly across the world, and we see all these BT vans driving around the place, he's actually responsible for perfecting the fiber optic cable because the cable wasn't um, being formed properly and it created bubbles. So these bubbles interfered with the, um, the transmission of the signal. So he devised a way of actually getting the cable to be made with glass um, without the bubble. So you get a better signal. That's why we had to talk to each other properly on the phone because of the infrastructure that he, he, he contributed towards. The other thing that he did was, um, you see, we heard a lot about nanotechnology now. And he's actually responsible for that. You know, the tiny little robots that they use to go inside your body and everything else. Thomas Mensa, and he's still alive in America. He's a guy from Ghana. So the fact that we're able to talk like this and he's not known, so nobody here, has no one heard of him, and he's still alive and he's still innovating. He's responsible for a lot of um, uh, 
um, technologies. But this is the thing, we don't hear about it because a lot of our uh, young technology guys are snatched up by America. They go out to Africa and get those guys as well. Um, there's even young ones who are responsible for a lot of robotics. And I think the youngest one was uh, recently a young kid. He's only 12 years old. And he's got into um, a university in America uh, to do technology. So, 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 young, so young Alan, are you, I, sorry to cut across you, um, as I, and it's fascinating. So you're, what are you, you proposing that either we are not championing these great minds, or is there something else that's holding, holding these great minds back? Two, two fronts, really. The, brain, the, the, the minds aren't being held back. It's the educating of us on a worldly basis to know that everybody, regardless of colour, is responsible for something. And for some reason, when it comes to the black um, community, our technology is taken and used, and the recognition is never there. And we mentioned earlier on uh, Lonnie, Lonnie Johnson, the super soaker, you know. Now, when he invented that, the company Asbro, the game company, the toy company Asbro, took his invention and wouldn't pay him the royalties for it. So he had to sue them for $72 million. That's how he's able to carry on doing things like inventing batteries that uh, can last for a thousand miles. You see all these type of things that, uh, that he's not being recognized for. Well, that's what he's currently doing a lot of things for the military. These batteries can run cars for over a thousand miles without recharging. You see all this technology is there, but later on it will come out and Lonnie will fade, uh, he will fade into the background. And that's what generally what happens. Same with the so music industry. I, so, so can I just ask Drew that? Thank you, Alan. That's okay. really interesting. Drew. Okay. Picking up from what Alan was saying and, and a little bit from what Michael was saying, I'm just going to throw it at you and see what comes back. Uh, gotcha. Do you believe there's still a strong racial bias in our current in our current space today? And if that's so, what was and what has been your different light bulb moments in this innovation technology space? Well, I've had. Th thank you, Martin. I've had, um, and I'll, I'll be completely on, on, honest with you and open. Uh, the death of George Floyd and the resonance of the Black Lives Matter, that really threw me, and it's thrown me quite a lot. Um, my other half, um, she's white, and no end of times do we have a debate on, um, on different views. I can't convince her of certain things, and she can't convince me of certain things, but we're together. We've been together for 30 odd years, and known each other for that, that amount of time. Um, they say history is not written. History. They say history is written by the victor. I disagree. I think history is distorted by the victor. And what's happened in? And I go back to my uh, childhood at, at school. Um, I was only taught two things, and I remember. And what I did. Luckily, there was another friend of mine who's black as well. We were in the same class, so I called him. I was, sometimes we have fake memories. Was it true? Did I learn this or didn't I learn this? So I rang him up and I said, Peter, um, what did you learn about um, black invention and black innovation at school? And he said, I learned about slavery and Martin Luther King. I kid you not, slavery and Martin Luther King. So I didn't learn about lots of innovation and things like that until um, Sunday school. Uh, education or Thursday school to try and um, because at school we were still I was still struggling and a lot of my peers were struggling so some of the teachers and some of the black community we put on extra evening courses to try and uh, push us up and it was then that I learned a lot about the positive things about um, uh, black history and also innovation and unfortunately almost uh, accomplishments by non-white people has almost gone against, and I'm not saying all, I'm just saying that um, some intellectuals um, have used the, uh, the stamping on the neck of black people to further their careers and their propaganda and their indoctrinations. Um, and fundamentally, this almost goes back to the slave trade where the black person has not 
be, should not have been classed as a human being, and he's had to be classed as uh, as almost like an animal. And that indoctrination and that propaganda has continued onwards. Even when we look at the education system at school, what's his name? Gavin Williamson, I think, is the education secretary. Um, people went to him and they said, look, um, uh, Gavin, look, Gav, um, how about we don't want to include separate black history, because that's what they were trying to do, separate black history uh, to be taught at schools. Um, and that black, separate black history um, was offered up further education in the UK from 20, I think it was from 2015. And over four years, not one single further education college has taken up the option in the syllabus to teach black history. But black history and black innovation should not only be taught um, as, an, uh, as an aside, it should be included. Otherwise what happens, and this is what happens to myself and all the, my peers, all the other fellow kids at the same uh, class, what we were taught at school, we believed. So in later on, when a friend of mine, an Islamic scholar said to me, oh, a black guy invented this, a black guy invented that. I went, well, no, he didn't. I didn't learn that at school. I don't believe you. So it wasn't until years down the line do I realise that, yes, these are true, but I have been almost um, indoctrinated to think that black people had not actually invented anything or anything of, of, of importance. So it was almost like a, a dishonourable scholarship. But I felt, even now, I still have warm memories about how wonderful and great my school was. And that shows that the school had actually, and the school system had actually done its purpose. It hadn't failed in its purpose. It might have failed me, in what I wanted to do looking further forward. But if the purpose was to uh, not to get me to innovate, not to get me to uh, book the system, not to um, get me to try and support others, it had succeeded in, the, in, that, um, in that goal. Thanks uh, for that, Drew, because you know, innovation, like anything we do, there is a passion. Um, you know, the seeing and meeting the needs and, and trying to overcome that. I'm going to come back to you in a minute, Alan, but I want to ask Michael this, um, because I, I think your perspective earlier, as it's about collaboration and working together rather than colour, per se, um, and what comes to me always is a quote from Steve Jobs. Innovation distinguished between a leader and a follower. Do you feel that what we seem to want to do more is be followers rather than leaders? And if that's the case, and this is my question, if that's the case, how do we in the West Midlands start to become the next future leaders and not followers? Nice, easy one, Martin. That's good. good. I'll go with that. Well, the first thing is we're in the right place. We're in absolutely the right place. History for good or ill will say that, says that the West Midlands is kind of the birthplace of industry, the Iron Bridge, the first Iron Bridge, um, the great giants of industry. And you had Americans coming over here, part of the Lunar Society to talk about. So there is a history of leaders being in this region. If we want to be part of this, there was a, a, an organization called Eshango, which was a science, technology, and maths, didn't have the engineering bit in there, which I had the privilege of being on the board of that, which did this kind of, which was about creating leaders. And we brought some great people there to talk to young people and develop that. I just want to touch a little bit on what Drew said, and I'm going to connect this to leadership. But um, Arthur Schoenberg, when he was a child, and he was a, a great scholar, and there's a, a library in, uh, I think it's New York, named after him. When he was a child, he was told, a bit like you, that, that there were no, Afri he said African people had done nothing great. There were no heroes, and there were no inventors, and there were no astonishing people to do that. And he couldn't believe it. And he just had one question for his teacher, he said, where are our historians? Because then I, he said, I want to hear what our historians say. And then he spent the rest of his life um, creating one of the greatest libraries of African 
and African-American and uh, African diaspora history. So that was one response. Also, um, Dr. Henry Clark said, history is a clock that a people uses to tell the time, their political time. And if we understand history, it will tell us where we've been and also what we need to go forward. He also said, when you say we have no history, you must ask yourself why a race would feel it necessary to remove a people from the polite commentary of their history from the annals of mankind. You see, black history is nothing more than the missing pages of world history. There's no difference, it's just a missing piece. And the first thing we need to do with our leaders, as um, Garvey said, without a knowledge of our history, we can't do anything because we don't know who we are. And the Africans say, resting on his ancestors, a man gains strength to face the future. So the first step in leadership is to, and this comes to lunar society, is to understand we have to stand on the shoulders of those who came before. We don't need to start again. And this connects to IP piece as well, the intellectual property. We need not to discard our history. And if we don't know we've got it, it's not easy not to discard something you don't know you've got. So we have to really believe it's connect. So I think that one of the things I would do differently if I was running an organization like STEM again, I'd make science, technology, engineering, and maths start with the history of science, technology, engineering, maths, which is why I think this, this conversation we're having now is so important and so great. Because great leaders, if you look at them, they've had mentors, they've had guides, they've had something that meant that they had a, a, um, an advantage. And without that advantage, it is so very, very hard to compete on any stage. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I, I agree with that. And I also agree. I also think that there, there is space for um, to be pioneers in the tech sector. And I think in, in when we're talking about innovation and technology and we we think about um i think it's very crucial for leaders to be in this space um but it's also a really exciting time especially within our region that we are able to pioneer and and um be at the forefront of very exciting times we are the um we're in our region, we're running the 5G test bed, which means that there are various different initiatives in terms of automation, um, uh, or, uh, uh, driverless, car, you know, driverless cars, and um, uh, we also have the Black Coder um, Skills Initiative as well, which is specifically for um, Black females who are code, who are developing uh, the coding skills to code the future. Um, these are these are ways in which, if we're implementing those crucial skills, practices and initiatives that we are able to shape, um, especially uh, tech leaders within the black community to become pioneers and empower them with the skills that they need to help shape the future. Um, and I, I think that's a, an, an important point to, to uh, recognize as well. Thanks, Mike. Alan, yeah. I'm gonna come back to you, but I'm gonna also pose the question slightly different to you before picking back up with Drew. We talk as if we're in a singular bubble or a singular form with this male or female, whether it's black or white. What are the real things that are holding this back? And, how would you, and if you could change it, the world tomorrow morning, what would that one thing be? Right. First of all, uh, if we look back through history, um, there's a saying in Africa. When an old person dies, a library is burnt down because that person does not pass on that knowledge. Or oral passing on in Africa was a common thing. But when an old person dies today, that knowledge doesn't get passed on. Now, the other thing to look at is that you talk about things like toothpaste, uh, charcoal toothpaste. Recently, if you look back a few years ago, in Africa, they've been digging up the books that they had to bury. They had to bury them because 
Um, even under David Cameron, David Cameron, when he was uh, in power, he told the soldiers to go through um, the uh, Sudan and burn their libraries. But now they're digging up their books, which have been buried. And all these things like charcoal, toothpaste, are all in there. And now they're making libraries in Tin Book 2 that you can actually go and see these manuscripts and things of all the inventions. Um, don't forget, Europeans used to go to Tin Book 2 to, to be educated. So a lot of things have come from Africa. But again, we don't get recognition for it. And that's our fault, really, because we don't speak loud enough about things that we've done. We don't recognize things. Well, perhaps we don't feel the need to. But the thing is that we need to be at the forefront of if our narrative is being delivered, we should be delivering that narrative. So nobody can say they didn't do this. They didn't do that. Provide the proof. And that's where the proof is lacking. When, a lib when an old person dies, that library is burnt down. And Thank you, Alan. Yep. Okay. True. And, and, and thank you for the, your contribution. I think it's, it's highly important in how we are shaping uh, the discussion. And, this, and that discussion about recording, um, you know, Michael talked about intellectual property. Again, the intellectual property of writing it down or, or just taping uh, a series of these conversations are just as important because it's, a, it's about education. It's about providing a means of communicating to others what has already gone in your past. So you're quite right, Alan. Drew, um, you know we've been down that innovation cycle in so many different ways. You've worked so often in, in health innovations and all the activities we're doing and generating wonderful intellectual properties in this region. But if you had one thing that you would make happen moving forward out of Black History Month now, in the area you do in healthcare innovation, what would that be? Well, this is, um, so thank you again. For me, the, the one thing I would try to do, and I'm trying to work on that with, it, with one of the projects, this Innovation Factory Cooperative, where I want to try to reduce the barriers to entrepreneurship. And there's many different um, barriers. Uh, there could be funding, there's education, there's building the right team around them. Uh, and uh, But for me to try and reduce those barriers, I would say that one, one thing I would like, to, and that is to uh, almost have, when you're incorporating a, a, a company in the Articles of Association, that there must be a diversity element to it, an inclusive element, so that um, you know, the governance, who's going to be doing what, and it's the responsibility of the chairperson within those articles to ensure that the board, everybody that they, he, he or she sees, or see, he or she sees around that table represents the company that they work for, the community that they serve, or the customers that they serve. So what this will do is it will move away from over-representation of boards to a more inclusive support. So it may be that um, through that there's some kind of a Rooney rule to state that for every position, um, you've got to interview somebody um, who doesn't look like you, who doesn't sound like you, who doesn't have the education of you. Or maybe it's legislation that says, um, uh, to make sure for this company to be incorporated, you've got to have these people on the board or these as non-executive directors, something like that. Uh, because once um, the board sees the value of having uh, a diverse board level and a diverse workforce, they will see that there's financial benefits to it. So it's not about it's the right thing to do to have a diverse uh, uh, workforce, a diverse board, or have black people or Asian people on the board, there's a financial benefit to it. And with most of these companies, if you can say to them, well, you make this decision, you're going to stand a 35%, and that's the McKinsey report states that, um, black people or ethnic minorities on your board, you're 35% more likely to have profits in the top quartile than in the bottom quartile. From that financial perspective, and even if you look at um, Deirdre touched on this a little bit about slavery. Why was slavery kind of like abolished? Um, and if we consider that it wasn't until 2015 that 
we had stopped paying for those uh, our uh, forefathers to be taken out of slavery, um, 40% of the GDP. So that is a quite a strong argument for me as, an, as a business person. It would be, okay, what we're going to do, if you change your business practice, we're going to carry on paying you for the next 100 or so years. Okay, fair enough. And I do have to do what? Easy, easy decision. So we've got to try and put something in place to make the decisions to do the right thing really easy. So that was my light bulb moment. Really. Uh, I, and I wanted you to get that out because I know how passionate you are and the journey you've been down there. And oh, yes. <laughs> and actually, Ooh, and actually yes. in one, one bizarre way, like everything else we see, whether it's the, the, the toothpaste, whether it's the uh, electric light bulb, within every community, there is a need for the unmet need. And it, whether we stand on one side of the point of, what, of, the, of the equation, it doesn't really matter. You've seen that there's an unmet requirement and that alone is disruptive. That alone starts us to think anew, that alone starts looking at what can we import and what can be, be available. I'm going to try and wind up quite shortly because I don't want to stand in front of this wonderful singer sitting in, United, in the United States. But before I do, I wanted to just sort of come back with Marika in terms of what I'm noticing in society is a desperate need from our female leaders to climb that ladder. And there have been certain occupations that they've been denied of, you know, um, technology being one, engineering being another. And, and yes, when we talk about the creative mind, the mind for developing things that really change society, predominantly there's a, a very large bunch of leaders that are coming up with these things. Uh, us men who may control a large proportion of the wealth seems to want to be able to hold that to ourselves. But how would you, as a young woman of colour, a black woman of colour in technology, turn around to your peer group and show what can be done in the next century or even the next five years? What would you do? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I, one of the ways that I'm doing that already is working with schools, um, further education, uh, higher education, um, educational establishments, and, and working on more inspirational and, and hiring the aspirations of um, uh, females in the tech space. And that's by showing role models and leaders and also exposing them to, um, to technology um, and and what the future could look like, but it's also about tapping into the mindset of those of uh, the next generation and and asking them those questions of what do they see the future looking like? If we look at there's reports that are saying that you know even sixty percent of the jobs within the the tech and um, the tech sector those jobs are, haven't even been created yet. So there's still, there's, so when I spoke earlier about being in a position of pioneering um, change in the technology sector, there, there's, there's opportunities for them to shape what that looks like. And it's about exposing them to um, the existing um, uh, technologies and um, where in, in across all sectors, it, whether that may, may, may whether that may be in augmented reality or um, app development, um, it could be it it could be in um, engineering and, and across across the sector. So I think it's about exposing it's about raising the aspirations, motivating them by exposing them to what the what those possibilities can look like but also hearing from them about what their um what they what they would what good would look like for them in the future and what that what the technology space um could uh what potentials could come out of that um and i'm really excited that i'm working with a fantastic organization 
called NIO Enterprise who are leading on the Black Coda um, initiative, who are, who are specifically, um, we funded them to specifically um, uh, develop and train uh, uh, Black females whose jobs are at risk of automation um, with the relevant coding and data analysis skills that they need for their, to divide, either develop their own enterprises or for the demands of the jobs market. And these sorts of initiatives is about empowering their voices, making sure that they have learned the right skills and also inspiring and raising their aspirations for what they think the, the future could look like and where they see themselves contributing to the future. So that's that's one of the ways I think it can happen. Thank you, Rafika. And, and I. I wanted to draw that out because Michael touched on it. And I, it's a question also been raised by uh, one of our, our, our participants online is, where is the role models? You started to bring that out. And, and ultimately, again, is we are all role models. Yeah. So the conversation piece needs to be up on more occasions. Um, somebody wonderfully told me way back in, and I might get the wrong the date wrong, Deirdre, so please shoot me if I do. 1776, uh, when Darwin, Erasmus Darwin came together with all those wonderful enlightened people in the dark um, to, to trottle all the way down and uh, created the Lunar Society and all the wonderful things he's done. Um, it was about sharing knowledge and it, you know, that part in life is totally different from the next part we're going to go down. Um, but ultimately, it is about recognition of value. Uh, and part of that value set, as we sit now within a region that is multi-diverse, that is the youngest in Europe, yeah. but with also the ability of young, bright talents in our females, young well, Drew's no longer young, we've served too many years, but you know, we've gone through that mature period as like a good wine. Um, and all of that as a part, Michael and Alan's creativity, that actually is the jewel in the crown that makes us unique. Unique on a global stage that we don't ourselves appreciate. The ability to actually have this conversation, to find a safe place, and to look at our different intellectual properties, the asset value, the asset pool, will change us more than we think if we collectively hung that in. And what I would like to say before handing back to Deirdre is, thank you very much. Thank you, the Lunar Society for being able to have this conversation, to use this platform in this virtual world, so that actually there are a ways in which we can exchange views and come to a common understanding. And more importantly, how we can all be role models for each other and for the next generation. So once again, thank you very much. Deirdre, the floor is all now yours. Oh, thank you so much all. Um, this panel was incredible. And um, I know you've all been seated very, um, ve very nicely in your, your, your kitchens and your sitting rooms. I think I even saw somebody in a car. But anyway, um, but I'm going to ask you all actually to unmute. I think we need a bit of, of, of more human interaction. So please unmute and thank our panelists in the old fashioned way. And and I'm, I'm also certain that many of you probably have um, more questions and there were things that you wanted to say at each of these events. Believe it or not, we have actually gone over time, but our um, incredible singer, Marie Claire, has to be off somewhere in, in New York 
um, at um, eight o'clock our time, and she definitely doesn't want to be on BPT. So we are going to be handing over to her um, in, in a short while. But before I hand over to Marie Claire, I just wanted to just pull out some of the things that really resonated with me. And one of the big things that Dawn said actually was that black history is the missing piece of our world history. And, you know, and I grew up in the Caribbean where I had the privilege of actually learning um, black history, African and Caribbean history, alongside with European history and American history. Um, and actually Marie Claire uh, grew up um, in the Caribbean as well. And, and she, so she can understand where I'm coming from here. And I think it was, I didn't appreciate the privilege that I had at the time. And I certainly do now, which is a big part of the reason why I'm pushing this series um, here. And I, I think, you know, alongside with the um, names that we've heard here tonight of Dr. Lolly Johnson, Dr. Charles Drew, Mary Kinner, Thomas Mensah, all of these people, you know, the, our esteemed panel and all of you here tonight are also uh, right there alongside those people in terms of the recognition of the, the names and your contributions as leaders and as pioneers. Um, I'm very excited that we are going through the Lunar Society, going to be pushing this through. I am very much about catalyzing that action. So we will be moving things forward. Um, and, and one of the other things that, that I think it was Drew who brought up the idea of inclusivity and diversity, which brings that diversity of experience to organizations that, that can impact their bottom line. We had uh, Dr. Carl George on um, previously, and, and we are also going to be doing the Sir Adrian Cadbury lecture, where um, Dr. Carl George, together with Liam Byrne, are going to be introducing the Race Equality Code on the 29th. So one of the big things that I, I've realized in this whole series, actually, and it was brought forth even more so today, was the important feature that the original Lunar Men had. And that feature was collaboration and communication, not just within the meetings, but certainly outside of the meetings. And they redefined social relations. They stressed joint efforts that promoted synergy, intellectual property, legacy ownership. And we have that opportunity now to do this, not just in Birmingham, but on a worldwide scale to recognize that asset value, as, um, as Martin said. So let's keep the conversation going. Please do join our LinkedIn page. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn, the Lunar Society. If you are, you can tweet at Lunar Society and you can, um, if you're going to be talking about this on social media, please do use the hashtag Lunar Society. So, all that being said, given this incredible night where we've been talking about revolutionary impacts, um, I am pleased and honored to present to you tonight an incredible woman. Her name is uh, Marie Claire Giraud. She is uh, from the island of Dominica, the most beautiful island in the world. Uh, forgive me anybody else from any other islands who are on, on the call. Um, Marie Claire grew up in the Bronx. Uh, she studied in Rome. She studied in Italy. She debuted at Carnegie Hall. She's performed on world stages, including Madison Square Gardens, the Barclays Center, the United Nations, Jazz at Lincoln Center, you name it, she's done it. She's also even collaborated with the Pulitzer Prize winning composer, John Harbison. And I'm sure many of you will remember him from um, the, oh, what was it? Marie Claire, help me. It was, is, oh, it was, forgive me. I can't remember the one. <laughs> it's terrible. But um, she she mixes her her own operatic vocals with other genres of music. So I am pleased and honored to present to you tonight, for the Lunar Society's entertainment, Marie Claire Giraud. Thank you so much, Deidre, for having me. Um, I wrote this song and, and Dee asked if I would sing it. And so this is the first time I'm singing it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I would like to, um, because sometimes Zoom can be kind of, you know, sketchy. I want to read you guys the lyrics first before I 
sing it because the lyrics are quite important. So the song is called The Haunting of Us. Broken bodies on the ground, bloody earth and sudden sounds. I hear, oh, I hear the calling of the wind as I plow the earth on my broken wings. Haunting, haunting, haunting. Haunting, haunting, haunting. COC, my children weep. COC, the blood on their feet. COC, OC, angels come carry me. Haunting, haunting, haunting. COC, COC, how the ocean feeds on me. And here is the song. Broken bodies on the ground, bloody earth and sudden sounds. I hear, I hear the Broken wings, haunting, 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 haunting. See, oh, see, my children. Children weep, see, oh, see, the blood on the feet, see, oh, see, you so much for you um Marie Claire has has long been a friend of the Lunar Societies <laughs> and um and just I'm just so delighted that that you joined us and Marie Claire I'm I know you you are a little pressed for time but I wondered if you could yes. could just probably give us a, a short um just a short background of of you of what's brought you to where you are and and the the background to the to the um, song, really. Well, the song I was watching um, the movie with Janelle Monae that just came out called Antebellum, and that's how a lot of original songs come to me. Is that it's inspired by something that I've either seen or I've heard, and the movie was so incredibly moving that even before I realized it, I was writing, I was singing the song, and I just got a pen. And I just got my pen and notepad and just wrote it down, and and that's what and that's what came out. And um, it's 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 I sing with my I always say I sing with my ancestors. It's it's a very emotional thing for me. And um, 
I, my mother said that I sang before I spoke. So singing, it's like I was in the womb. It's like singing was part of my DNA. It's, it's not something that I, um, it's not a hobby. It's, it's, it's a part of me. It's a part of who I am. And um, I'm just grateful that I never gave up and I am still doing it because it brings me so much joy. And I hope it brought you guys joy. <laughs> I think it certainly did. Would you, <laughs> just one last question before you go, yes. America. Would you say that your, your work and is, um, has contributed innovative, innovatively to, to the furtherance of, of Black um, prosperity and, and moving things forward for Black people? Well, I, I hope so. I mean, I don't have like a major platform, like a, a, a celebrity, but I hope in the performances that I've done that, um, um, that I hope that I inspire young people, especially children of color and, and just children everywhere to pursue their dreams and not to give up. Because right now, all roads lead, lead to Rome. It doesn't matter how you do it. You know, it's no longer the conventional road of going to a conservatory and, and it's all mapped out for you. It's all roads are fine. Take whatever road you need to take to get there, you know? And there's so much technology right now um, regarding learning that you don't need to be in a classroom to learn. There's YouTube tutorials. There's all kinds of stuff that are easily downloadable for free that you can, um, that you can access and gain knowledge from. So it's like, go out there and get it. And we're all a work in progress and it's never too late. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> right, Claire, thank you so much. One of our uh, exec members has put in the chat, I'm thinking Marie Claire would be a great addition to a Lunar Society annual dinner in real time. So yeah. I think <laughs> we're either going to have to come to New York for a dinner or fly you out. <laughs> hey, I'm on the first plane over there, okay? <laughs> okay, well, that being said, thank you everyone for your time this evening. Thank you, Marie Claire. We really do appreciate it. You're and welcome. um I'm actually going to ask everybody to unmute. Um, we have just a few more minutes and please do uh, chat oh. to yourself, say hi. I'm sure you've seen people on here that you recognize or that you've seen or somebody that you actually want to say hi to um, or you can chat to them in the chat. But thank you so much for, for your time this evening. And again, thank you to our esteemed panel. Martin for his really incredible chairing that has just brought us on a journey. I think he deserves a massive round of applause. See, I have to go, okay? I love you. Okay. Love you. Okay. <laughs> and thank you also to Marika. Uh, Marika, you brought such a, an exuberance and uh, the viewpoint of the young and the youth and the pioneering elements that we must not forget. And we have to keep striving for that future and empowering the youth. So thank you so much for that. Don, thank you for bringing that integrity to the conversation. It was just phenomenal and bringing us back to that, that importance of the history of, what, of how we need to be progressing. Andrew, oh my goodness, your honesty and transparency just brought us to another level. So thank you so much everyone for this evening. Thank you for your time. And remember, please do ask questions, join us whenever you'd like. And of course the Lunar Society is open for you to join us whenever you would like. So thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.